Now you said you're watching what's occurring. What did you see? I saw Mr. Wilson turn around and take a large, exaggerated step down from where, from where he was. All right. And so he is facing <clears throat> what turns out to be your father, right? And when you say exaggerated step down, describe that. I initially described it as, as possibly stepping down a road. It seemed that exaggerated to me. I didn't know whether he had stepped down a road or not. Uh, but it was an exaggerated step in that led me to believe he possibly could have stepped down a road. Did you see any change in his, his height at all? As of my being <coughs> lower. Could you tell if he was standing straight up or bent over? He was standing straight up. At that time? And what's the next thing you observe? Steps down, and then he started walking out towards the aisle. And what did you do? As I came up, I was watching him. When I observed that he started to slump over, I went up the aisle, met him partially up the aisle, I grabbed a hold of him. I heard somebody else in the row assist me with laying him down, which somebody did get behind him and help him, and we lowered him to the ground on his back. Now, at that point, when you saw Mr. Olson coming down the row, had you put two and two together? Yes, sir. Okay, and what was your belief at that time? Uh, I knew at that point, once he stepped back, I was able to see that the father was behind him. And once I heard my father's voice, and then I heard that, I was able to put two and two together in that aspect. When, uh, when he was coming out, I figured he was shot. He started to slump over at which time I assisted him with the crown. And I immediately started to check his body. I looked at his shirt and see if he had been shot before. Now, when, um, where were you when you came into contact with Mr. Olson? Uh, you could indicate. Right in this area. Somewhere okay. in, in this area. So you're indicating the second row down from the top, is that right? I can't recall if I was the second or third row initially, because like I said, I didn't recall if he had taken a step down the road. But I was in either the second row down or the third. And as Mr. Olson comes down the row, you describe you catch him? Uh, he was slumping over, and I didn't want him to collapse under the floor. And the seat, so I was kind of caught him and then lowered him back with one of his back. OK, you can have a seat, please. <coughs> Now, t tell me what you did. Did you grab Mr. Olson by his arms, or what did you do? I believe I grabbed him by his uh, wrist, essentially. And, and I, when I ordered the other gentleman to grab a hold of him, he assisted with his back so that he didn't just fall backwards. And we laid him on his back. And where was Mr. Olson when he was laying on his back? In the aisle. When you say aisle, are you talking about the row, or is he actually over where the stairs are? He's where the seats are, where it's very narrow where the seats fold up in the row, essentially. So he's in between uh, the seats? <coughs> yes. And um, do you know how far down he is into that row? I don't recall. Um, and now you, you have some aid in, in laying Mr. Olson down. What's the next thing that you do? Uh, I initially uh, lifted his shirt up to check his body. Um, so I slid his shirt. Now, I don't recall what he had on exactly, but I slid his shirt up so I could see his body to see where he was shot. And were you able to see what appeared to be a bullet wound? Yes, sir. And what did you do? Uh, I used the same clothing that I pushed upwards that I had kind of bunched up in my hands to place over the wound and put direct pressure on the wound. Now, aside from hearing your father's um, excited, uh, fearful voice, do you hear your father say anything at all um, after the shot? No, sir. Um, and certainly by then, you're, you're pretty close proximity. Is that fair to say? I don't remember how close, but I could see him, yes. OK, you could see your father? Yes. Um, and do you see your father making any motions or doing anything? Uh, no, sir, just holding his face. I'm sorry? Just holding his face. And describe what you, what you saw. Uh, his glasses were sitting um, out of line with his eyes, and he was holding one side of his face. Um, so now you're with Mr. Olson. You're applying pressure. Um, can, did you see your mother? Not at that point, no, sir. What happens next? Um, I was talking with, I was basically talking to Mr. Olson at the time, telling him he was going to be okay, or telling him just keep talking, keep looking at me, keep breathing, uh, talking to him there. Somebody at some point handed me a, either a shirt or something, 
from behind me, at which time I placed that over the wound and continued to put direct pressure on it. Um, at some point, I don't know what the time frame was, somebody stated there was a nurse there, at which time, as the person replaced me, I explained to them where the wound was and to keep pressure on the wound. And uh, once the, the nurse took over, where did you go? Uh, initially, I backed out the row. I moved up to the top row and walked down that row and was essentially, I was asking my dad where the firearm was so I could secure it. Okay, and um, what, if anything, um, happened next? Uh, my father stated to me that a deputy, that he said he was in, I think believe he said he's a deputy. He has it and pointed to uh, the off-duty deputy that was standing next to my father. So when you got there, um, somebody else already had the gun? Is that uh, yes. And uh, did you see your mother at that point? Uh, yes. Where was she seated? Uh, I believe she was two, uh, a few seats away from my father. So she wasn't right next to your father is what you're describing? I don't recall. Yeah, I don't think she was. And what was um, your mother's emotional state at that point? She appeared to be in shock. And why do you say that? Describe for us what you mean by that. My mother's not good with confrontational. Judge, I put up the feeling well, Judge, it, it is relevant in terms of her emotional state. If she made a statement, um, certainly she's she is an excited utterance. She's under the the effect of the the shooting that she witnessed. Um, certainly, if she's in shock and and she says, "I don't I don't remember." anything, I, I didn't see it. Um, certainly it's relevant for, for those purposes, so I, it's relevant. It's brief to take the stand whether or not uh, this is in fact an excited utterance, I'll take an exception with. But right now the way the question is, is how does your mother feel? Uh, that's not even close to being laying <coughs> for an excited utterance. I asked what her emotional state was, Judge. I didn't ask how she felt. <coughs> He can, uh, I'm going to overrule as to the extent of what he observed. Okay. Your, your mother was sitting there? Yes. And um, did she say anything? No, sir. Was she crying? Um, she was extremely upset at that point. I can't recall if she was crying at that point or not. Um, were her hands shaking? She was shaking, yes. And did she say anything to you? No, sir. Now, you made sure that, number one, you, you've already helped Mr. Olson the best you can. Now you've gone down the row and you made sure the, the firearm's secure. Now you're with your mother. What's the very next thing you do? Uh, I essentially, I, I have a lot of blood on myself, on my hands. Uh, at that point, I did the check for the firearm. I explained to them I would be right back. I was going outside the kitchen to wash that off and to let them know to contact 911 and give them a little bit of information to management. Okay. Now when you came back um, after washing yourself off, did you have contact again with your mother? Yes. When you came back, where was your father? He was still seated in the same position. Um, what did you do when you came back? I immediately wanted to remove my mother from the scene. And what do you mean by that? Where did you take her? Uh, we went out to the lobby area. Now, when you went out to the lobby, were there other people in the lobby area? People were coming out of the theater into the lobby, yes. Now, the lobby area, does it have tables, or how is that, what area did you go to? There's tables. And so, you, did you see individuals congregating at those tables? Initially, no. Okay, and at some point, do they come out of the theater and congregate? Yes, me and my mother had sat at one of the tables, and nobody else was sitting, sitting there at the time. After uh, the officers had all started arriving, it concerned me that they were handing out um, what I know to be. Judge, I object as far as what concerned him about uh, what was occurring at that time. Uh, Mr. Reeves, at that point, is an off duty police officer. He is not conducting the Judge, I haven't heard a legal objection yet. And so it is not relevant as to what he thought uh, was going on at the time. Response. Judge, I can change the question to get the same answer, so I mean, we can do it that way, it's fine. Let me ask, I'll just change the question. Um, so once you went to the, um, the lobby area, um, did you observe any um, 
patrons from that were within the theater that had come out. Yes. And did you see any sort of witness forms being handed out to those individuals? Yes. Did you hear any of the police officers instruct any of those individuals not to talk to each other when they filled out those forms? No, sir. In fact, did you hear individuals talking about what they thought had happened in the theater? Yes. Did you hear any specific comments? Uh, they kept making the statement of he was shot over Paul. Uh, I'd like Brown out here. Sorry. Judge, it's not offered for the truth of the matter. Well, if it's not offered for the truth of the matter, it has to be for some relevant purpose. And right now, there is no relevant uh, purpose. Judge, the relevant purpose is that it has to do with witness contamination. We're going to have witnesses <coughs> within the theater come. And I think it certainly goes towards coloring their testimony as being truthful, untruthful, or to impeach them because it's an indication that that might not be their thought, that they were influenced by other statements. The problem, Judge, is the lack of specificity with the witnesses. There are numerous, numerous patrons. It could only have been two and, and five other, six other patrons <coughs> come in. We can't carte blanche cover the entire patrons with Mr. Reeves' statement about, uh, yes, I heard statements. We don't know who it is. Without the specificity, specificity it's not relevant. Yeah, yeah, that may be the old uh, one bad apple doesn't spoil the whole barrel. The problem is we're dealing with witness contamination. One bad apple does spoil the whole barrel. No. So um, you heard somebody say what? Uh, two people sat at our table with forms and started filling them out and we're discussing it. I removed my mom from that situation. Okay. Where did you go? Uh, when we initially got up, we moved to the front of the, the front center of the, uh, what you would call the, the food court area to the front counter area just because I wanted to move her away from everybody discussing what was going on. Did, um, was your mother still in the same emotional state you observed when she was in the theater, still shaking? She was shaking and crying. At some point, um, did you have contact with officers? Yes. In the theater? Uh, not inside. Not in the theater itself, not in theater 10, but in the theater in general, in other words? Yes, sir. Still within the building? Yes, sir. And um, tell me about that. Um, Initially, at one point, I identified myself as off-duty law enforcement, and I stated that the, uh, the subject involved was disarmed and that there was an off-duty officer in there that had the firearm in his possession. Okay. And um, were you still with your mom at that point? Yes, that was when I was walking out with her, out of the theater. And is she still shaking at that point? Absolutely. Um, now, at some point, um, do police ask to interview your mother? Yes. Oh, and is she still shaking when they go with her? We were all very shaken, yes. And did she um, go with the police? Yes. Did you go with her? Not during her interview, no, sir. Okay. And did you give an interview? Yes, sir. Now, um, to the best of your knowledge, um, was that interview recorded? I did not know. Okay. Uh, tell me about um, any diagram or anything else you, you, you might have done for the police at that point. I did draw a diagram when I was explaining that I thought he had taken an exaggerated step down. And you did that for the, uh, the individual who interviewed you? Yes, sir. Do you know who that was? I believe a detective, Aaron Smith. First name is Aaron. <coughs> Can I have a moment, Judge? You may. I don't have anything else. Thank you. Cross? Response.
he went through his background that he is in fact a police officer, uh, that he's on patrol, uh, that he's on the bomb squad. Lo and behold, they didn't ask before going on the bomb squad that there's a firearm instructor for three years. Uh, so I have a right to go into his entire police background because they opened the door. In fact, they left out some of the most important part of his background. So since they opened the door with his background, I have a right to explore that for three years he was in fact a firearm instructor. And, and I believe I did have a right to ask him about, as an instructor, exactly what the qualifications are and how you become an instructor. Because what you're going to hear over and over again, even in the defense statement, is my hands are so messed up, I can't even believe I pulled the trigger. When in fact, you're going to hear over and over again, that's what he does as a hobby. So I think it is relevant because the court remembers that relevancy under 4.2 is any tendency to pr prove a material issue in fact. And those statements and the credibility of Mr. Reed is in fact in play. So I have a right, just like I did with Mr. Shaw, about the use of the shotgun, I have the same right to go through that with Mr. Reed because they opened the door that he's a police officer and they left out what he did as a police officer. Response? Your Honor, if I may. Uh, Your Honor, our presentation of Mr. Uh, Reed is our prerogative when we present what evidence that we intend uh, to elicit at that point in time. We may bring back another time. In fact, most probably we'll, we'll bring it back another time. The aspect of the testimony that he wants right now is to go into uh, his qualifications as a firearm instructor. That hasn't even been discussed uh, in direct. Has not been discussed. Uh, there is a target that I think that they intend to show him and to talk to him about. That hasn't been discussed. They don't get to bring in new evidence or new testimony on their cross that hasn't been discussed in direct. I mean, that's as basic as it comes. If he wants to, at some point in time, he has Mr. Matthews, uh, Mr. Reeves, and Mr. Sabina, if he wants to bring Mr. Reeves back on his side, he can do so. But at this point in time, we have limited our direct in certain ways for our presentation, for our flow of the presentation. He can do whatever he wants during uh, his case in chief. It's totally inappropriate. Mr. Martin, any further argument? No, Judge, it's about the lunch hour, so I'll let you decide. And we'll with whatever you decide. All right. Um, I need to bring him back. I can bring him back. Or the court can let me take Mr. Reeves out of order right now as my witness, or you can let me cross him, or we can go to lunch and you can think about it. It's all up to you, Judge. Well, there's no question that uh, to some extent it, it's um, outside the scope, but the uh, the witnesses' qualifications were discussed and his training and stuff, um, background information, I shouldn't say qualifications. Um, so to the extent that there's more background, I think that's fair game and relevant. Um, to a limited extent, I don't know what the exhibit is that we're getting into, but that seems to be getting a little far afield. If I could just address that real quick, because you did allow the testimony of Ms. Shaw. Mm -hmm. And do you recall the testimony about his fingers? And they'd get this trigger finger, and they'd get hooked, uh, uh, hooked or, or whatever she said. You allowed the, the, this information about the physical uh, impairments of Mr. Reeves to come out. Now, the state has the right to rebut that. Now, I plan to do it through Mr. Matt Reed, his son, just like I did in the deposition. I know exactly what he's going to say. I'm going to go through the entire uh, qualification. I'm going to go through the entire course. In fact, Mr. Reed qualified twice in the same day, shooting over 80 shots back to back with these fingers that are so messed up that he can't even hold a cereal spoon. I should be allowed to go into that. 
Judge, uh, he can go into that, and it's true that Mr. Reeves did qualify, and Mr. Reeves actually is not only shot all those rounds, but he's pretty good at shooting those particular rounds. He's been excellent. In fact, I think Mr. Reeves will tell you that uh, his father's better than he is at actually shooting the gun. That has nothing to do with whether or not you can exceed the bounds of direct examination. This is not you just throw whatever you want up, up against the wall and you allow it. We did this for a particular reason. The reason we didn't ask him about that is because we didn't want to open the door. We didn't ask him whether he was a firearms instructor because we didn't want to open the door. It's the proper procedures that we have to employ in this court in order to make sure that the evidence is flowing smooth. For him now to get up and start into another line of questioning concerning a fire instructor and, and all that is, is moving. All right. And you're absolutely correct as far as that. It, I, it sounds like we're going to get far afield from from just the uh, background stuff um, and since there is an objection I'm going to honor that and sustain and um, Mr. Martin is free of course to recall Mr. Reeves in his case and uh, and we'll go that route. Uh, Mr. Martin is, is worried, trust me, we're going to be bringing him back and Mr. Reeves is going to be testifying about him shooting his weapon, how often he shoots his weapon, and how well he shoots his weapon. That is not an issue in this case. How well he shoots, I don't care. <coughs> There's no way to do it. Having said that, Judge, I understand your ruling. I have no cross at this point. I have Mr. Reeves under subpoena. I'm asking the court to inform Mr. Reeves that he's still under my subpoena and he's subject to my call, and I will call him in my case. I don't want to call it case of chief because it's really not, but Correct. I know I'm used to saying that. So I don't have any cross right now. I will call him back and I will handle him. Uh, in a direct examination fashion. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Martin. You're done then, uh, since there's no cross. We're going to reserve because we're probably going to be calling him back. Okay. Um, Mr. Matthew Reeves, um, just what the lawyer said. You're still under subpoena. Uh, you will be subject to recall. Um, is he able to leave the courthouse today? Okay. Okay. Um, just have your phone on and return any phone calls and you're still under subpoena. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Council, it's a good time for a lunch break. Um, how are we doing on witness times and... Dr. Foley is here. We'll have lunch and mm -hmm. he'll be first on. Okay. Uh, do we need longer than an hour, hour and 20 minutes? We could go to uh, 1.30. That would be great, Judge. All right, let's go. Um, Just to come. give the court the lineup, we're going to have Dr. Foley. We expect him to be uh, on the stand between direct and cross, maybe an hour, hour and a half, two hours. Uh, we then are going to have Dr. Cohen, which I think is going to be a little bit longer. And then we have Gino uh, Sasani, who is our last witness for the day. And, and he's going to be short. Okay. He's going to be the preview uh, authenticator. Judge, and as, <coughs> excuse me, as Mr. Sasani goes, I'd like to have an opportunity to speak to him before he testifies. I know his testimony is going to be very limited, but I would at least like to have an opportunity to speak to him. We'll make him available, Your Honor. Okay. Okay. Yeah. In fact, there's a, phone, there's a phone number that you have, and you can call him even now before if you'd like. Okay. All right, then. Um, we'll stand in recess until 1.30, and uh, you lost something on the front of your bench there. Any other matters that we need to address before we go on recess? All right, we'll be in recess till 1.30. Thank you.